Thank you all for coming to this important uh, workshop. I'm going to talk about uh, the management of uh, intraepithelial neoplasia. I'm sure all of you know how to to do LEDs and and all that. So we all remember this uh, flowchart from uh, clinical gynecology. I just want to remind you, not a lot have changed. There are the two groups of uh, squamous lesions, the low grade and the high grade, of which we, the, the low grade we usually, two LCL or ESCAS we refer for corposcopy, and, um, and we do a corposcopic directed biopsy, and then the high grade lesions, what we, we, in our setup, we usually do the one-step approach where we look with a corposcope and then we treat. So that is due to the fact that we are servicing uh, low social economic patients. Patients tend to not follow up and we have had issues even recently where a patient had a corposcope and never came back for the, uh, was never, never came back for, for um, did not go to the day clinic for the result and it turned out to be an, actually an invasive lesion. So uh, apart from the loop uh, excisions that we mostly do, there are also other excisions, the cone biopsy that we do in our theatre, but you should know about also other, especially in other provinces they do offer cryo uh, surgery. I think that's in KwaZulu-Natal, I'm not sure if it's still happening and also ablative procedures and um, uh, hysterectomies, just briefly on that. So I'll mostly focus on the loop uh, electrosurgical procedure, that we, which we most commonly do, and just to revise on that. So there's, the squamous lesions are into two groups. You get the low, gr low grade and the high grade. The low grade, uh, with our guidelines, we refer them if they've got two. Uh, pap smear showing low grade, which uh, and then they come for coposcopy and we do a biopsy. So high grade lesion, immediately we refer them to coposcopy and we offer them treatment. So this is uh, from the American Society for Coposcopy, uh, the one that Liana has said. In fact, I actually have an app on it so you can download an, uh, download an app and then you just enter the patient details and it guides you what, what the management is. Just keep in mind that you, it might require you to enter the HPV status, but you can also skip it and it will give you. So it's quite a good app. This is on a patient that has had a, uh, was referred for a low grade and then she came and you did a biopsy and she come and it comes back as a seen one lesion. Uh, so this is a good guide that can show you if, it's a, if, if you don't have HPV testing, we've just seen one, you can follow them up. You ask them to repeat the pap smear again. But if, uh, what I just want to show here is that if she has persistent uh, seen one, you can't just keep uh, thing. You have to refer them and you have to think about offering them uh, treatment. Not only she comes to colposcopy, you biopsy, she goes back, she comes again, she biopsy, she goes back, you know, and this keeps showing in one. And also, the way you are taking that biopsy is very important. So you must take it that you should be able to do multiple biopsies and also from the transformation zone, ideally from the endocervical zone. So it doesn't make, it doesn't help the patient just taking biopsies from the ectocervix and then it comes back as slow. Okay? So um, for to do a loop excision or a LED, um, um, you, should, you should be able to see the transformation zone. I know that uh, in our setup, you don't have to see an entirely transformation zone. We've discussed about it, uh, type one, type two, type three. You don't want to do a LED on a patient that is obviously have an invasion. We've talked about that. Uh, we, you, uh, where you can microscopically see it. <laughs> it's fungating there, you know. So you can just biopsy. Um, and uh, glandular lesions, um, you can. I know that I've put that here. You, you can, but in good hands, you can do a proper lens if we have abnormal glandular lesion. And also when there's a discrepancy between the pap smear that you had and the biopsy. So those are also things to keep in mind. <laughs> So Haynes and both Prof have talked about our uh, our trolleys that we use. Uh, just keep in mind that 
Um, you can also use an insulated uh, speculum uh, it, just to reduce the uh, bending of the vaginal mucosa. You have to use different sizes of, of your uh, lead, I mean your loops. Uh, you must use the appropriate size and uh, the staining that you use, uh, Lugol and the acetic acid. So the generator, our corposcopic generators uh, have an inbuilt uh, smoke extractor, as, you've, as they've alluded before. This is actually the one that we're using when we go on outreach with power. So I don't know if they still have this. So uh, the energy that you use in these generators rather start with a low energy. You start with 35 watts and then you can increase it. Uh, 40 watts is basically more than enough. I know sometimes we tend to increase the energy because of the fact that we are using our loops and the loops are old or we are not, we are not doing the proper loops. Um, the steps I'll just go through again. We all know the steps. The first step is to sit with the patient, discuss the finding of the, of the cytology results, counsel the patient, take uh, all the information that is relevant. Our form has the patient uh, risk factors on it, whether she has multiple sexual partners, she's been seen before and all those things. You obtain consent. Uh, what is very important is that you should make sure that the patient is comfortable because it's a procedure that you're going to do and sometimes the patients are quite anxious. Uh, when you are doing the procedure, start with a coposcope. I know there's that issue of people just going straight for the lens rather than doing a coposcope. Uh, you don't want to do a lens if you can see that there is an invasion and all that. And uh, don't forget to apply the Lugol iodine, just so that you have a proper delineation. Um, just coming back to Esti's question, this is uh, what I wanted to show. So, <laughs> okay, so um, I've put this, uh, so you, you can, what is recommended is from left to right or even from up and down, I prefer up and down. You take your, your leads on the transformation zone, and then if there's more lesions, then you can take away this lesion superficially. You know, you don't have to go very, very deep. Also, if you have a type three type of um, um, uh, transformation zone, you can do where you do first the transformation, then you take a smaller loop, and then you take the endocervical part of it. So this is also quite a good, good picture. So. Um, this we all do. So you start ideally when you've done your, your Lugol iodine, you don't want to start where the, where the mark is. You rather want to start at least two to three millimeters on the normal tissue, uh, left to right or up or down, and then uh, it should be deep enough. So you should choose your appropriate size of the uh, cut loop that you're using. It should go in at least 10 millimeters or even more. and the trick about this is that you shouldn't rush, okay? Because the loop will tend to bend if you rush, so give time for the energy to work, and it's very, very easy. Um, when, when we have, so after this, you have some bleeding, so if you, especially if you haven't applied proper anesthetic on it. So how you apply the bulk tree is you take first a swab, you clean there, you dry it, because the bulk tree will not work if if you have a wet surface area there. So you must first dry that area and then you now start on the outside part, on the edges, because that's, those are mostly the, um, the most common site where you start, where it starts to bleed. So once you've gone on your edges. Uh, just give another tip. If you yes. start polarization, start at 12 o'clock anteriorly because the bleeding is always going posterior. Yes. And as you sort of continue to swap all the time, as you say, it must be dry, otherwise yeah. it will be one so don't do what I was doing when I started. So it will bleed a lot, then I just put that and stay the pot and it becomes all frothy and then it's, and then the bulk of tree is all wet. So, I mean, all like covered with black stuff. So just take a swab oh, holding the dry right face and you can start. Yeah, so just emphasize what you see. 
I, I see what the loops look like. The, obviously, we're actually not supposed to reuse them. They, they're for single use, but, but we, we do reuse them. And some of them are very bent, and, and it's because you don't allow the electrical energy to cut through. You, you try and force it through. So as Joseph said, just to re-emphasize, be patient and allow the electric current and energy to cut through the tissue. Um, and just the, whether you cut up, down, or side to side, we all kiss our wives or our husbands or our partners or whatever the way that we like to. The reason why I go side to side is often if you go top bottom, if you start to top, it starts bleeding. That blood runs over the, the area where you still need to cut. Uh, whereas if you do it from, from side to side, uh, there's, there's never blood over the part of the cervix where you need to, uh, to cut. That's just the method in the bag. I just also want to add, and um, I gave a very nice picture about electrosurgery, and um, for the cutting to work optimally, you have to start with it not touching tissue. You have to start pressing the button before you touch the tissue, otherwise you will struggle to get an effect. And you get stuck in the middle of your legs, which is the worst thing. Yeah. So, what is also important is to choose the right speculum, okay? Remember what Dr. van der Merwe said, the nozzle must be up, not down, because it, the whole point is not to suck um, blood into that pipe. It's basically to suck the, the gas out so that you're able to see. And some of that is HPV, actually. So you should be able to cover yourself with a mask and, and, a, and a visor. OK. So once you're done with the LEDs, so you have to definitely um, there is a patient information leaflet that you have to give to the patient, but it's also very important to, to tell the patient the precautions and the side effects of, of the procedure that you've done. Mainly, they should abstain from uh, any uh, sexual intercourse for a period of four weeks, avoid using any tampons inside, or avoid swimming, uh, and also just to explain to them that their next cycle might be heavy and abnormal. They might experience a bit of, 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 of discharge. But you should also highlight the danger signs so that they don't just regard it as normal, but they should come back. So signs of infection, where they have fever or severe pain or, or heavy bleeding, so they should come in. And also the role of antibiotics. So you can write up some antibiotics, especially in immunocompromised patients and, and some analgesics also. Okay. So the follow-ups, um, we usually ask them to follow up at their local clinic where the sister will call at, um, to our colposcopic clinic. Ideally, uh, somebody must have checked the results in the fall and to come up with a plan or maybe discuss it with one of the consultants. And usually if it's, if it's just an um, scene one or two or three, we will just ask them to uh, repeat their pap smears in six months. Uh, the whole point is the incompletely excised. Sometimes you get that it's incompletely excised in the endocervical margins. The whole issue behind that is that there is a high incidence of, of recurring, but it's not an, yet an indication to do a re-excision. Uh, remember when you are doing the, um, the loop cautery, you are also burning there. So, so there's no evidence. As long as there's no uh, glandular abnormalities or no evidence of invasion or, or in younger women, you are, you are happy to just ask them to repeat the pap smear in six months. So we've talked about the squamous part. We're going to talk briefly on the glandular part. Uh, the glandular part a bit tricky. Uh, Jenny have highlighted according to the Batista's classification where you get atypical glandular cells, fevers, neoplasia, not otherwise specified. So you have to really be careful and investigate them properly because you don't, don't want to miss a pathology coming from the endos mitral cavity or, or even just the endocervix, which is high up. 
So in good hands, you can do a, a punch biopsy, but I'm speaking under correction, but just keep in mind that you have a, a low sensitivity in the diagnosing glandular lesion. So I want, what we recommend is probably a good excision, either with a laser or with a, with a cone biopsy. Um, just keep in mind that sometimes you get very young women who have atypical glandular cells. You don't want to now overtreat. Usually just give them a course of antibiotics and repeat the cytology. Cold knife cone. Um, cold knife cone is uh, where you basically want to cut the cervix in a cone shape. Okay, it should be done in theater. Uh, under good uh, an, an anesthesia. Usually it's regional an anesthesia, but sometimes they give a, a general anesthesia. This is an um, indication where you have a, sometimes a very short cervix. You're not able to, to do a proper LEDs in it at the clinic or adenocarcinoma in situ where you want to uh, properly diagnose a patient and to prevent skip lesions. Um, or you suspect an early and uh, cervical cancer, or even just a treatment of an early cervical cancer, you can use a cone. And also where you have a discrepancy between the um, um, abnormality, psychology, cytology, and colposcopy. So, so just a brief uh, slides on other modalities that you can use. Uh, cryosurgery, this is... Um, uh, a simple, usually recommended for low middle income, low income countries. Uh, it's usually ideal for, for as a C and treat method where you either use a acetic acid staining or, uh, or local iodine staining. Ideally, it, it's for thin lesion, mainly thin one lesions, but there, there must be criteria that must be fulfilled and you must have, still have a colposcopy referral system pathway. So usually they use a nitrous oxide, so you must have supply of nitrous oxide, either cylinders or, or from the system. So the criteria is as ideally for young patients, I think less than 40 years old, you must be able to see the transformation zone. It must be a lesion that is not covering more than 75% of the entire cervix. And it's ideally for T1 type of transformation zone. The other uh, techniques that are there are the ablative technique. I've never come across this one. So it's a thermal coagulation using about 100 to 110 degrees Celsius um, to destroy the, 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 the transformation zone part. It's mainly, it's almost the same as the cryotherapy where you first do a uh, um, stain and then, I'm not sure if you actually stain here. So, but the, the whole point is if you can see the probe, uh, this is the area that goes to the transformation zone. And um, the criteria for using the ablative therapy is mainly the same as, 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 as the cryotherapy. Then the lastly is the uh, hysterectomy. Um, hysterectomy, we, we, do, to, do refer, uh, we do refer patients for hysterectomy if they have, for example, an adenocarcinoma in situ or patients who are very early stage cervical cancer or patient that where uh, they have other indications for, for hysterectomy, maybe abnormal uterine bleeding due to fibroids and she's had persistent H. So, so then you can do uh, um, um, hysterectomy. Uh, just keep in mind that if you are doing it for a early stage or adenocarcinoma, you must make sure that you do not have missed a, a, a occult uh, invasion, so you must have free margins and uh, you are sure that you haven't left out any invasion. So that's it. Thank you. Actually, just a comment um, on this. Um, patients that normally get the LEDs, when they come, we do pap smear, they've got an H cell. And um, it's nicely been explained now, it's because we've been not cutting that whole, actually, the leftover part. And the role of the, or using the roller ball in that area just to bend it, sort of debulking or okay. sort of decays. It does it also okay. Mm -hmm. All right. in, in that area on the yes. periphery, because yes, uh, because yeah. remember that that 
there aren't any glands there, so, so you don't get uh, lesions extending down into crypts. So, so there you only need to destroy the superficial epithelium. Sorry, I know everyone is tired, but I just have one quick question because I struggle with the elderly woman who cervical os is a bit stenotic and they come with HCO and your corposcopy is inadequate and your endocervical speculum unfortunately can actually not fit into the cervical os. So if they come with an HCO, I'm tempted actually to just do a let's, although sometimes you don't really see something because there's atrophic changes. I just wanted help on how we can actually help these type of patients. Uh, with a pulse we are showing a Yes. So and you can't, it's not adequate, and you can't see an obvious vision. And you can't see the Remember, so, with, so, with so menopause, so the 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 concert is you need to do a cut. Yeah, but can I just correct Ronya? So, so the fact that you can't see the whole of the transformation zone doesn't mean it's inadequate. Yeah. You can see the whole of the cervix, so it is an adequate corposcopy, but you can't see all of the transformation zone. So you describe that transformation zone as a type 3 transformation zone. If that patient has a high grade lesion and you can't see anything echocervically, then I become extremely anxious because that means that those abnormal cells, they don't come from nowhere, they come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they usually come from higher up in the canal where, as you say, you can't with it. Those patients have a very small stenotic cervix. You, you can't even get a COVID speculum in there. So, so those patients, that is exactly where your corposcopy helps you because then it doesn't help if you cut a very shallow place. Then you need to go deep in to get some to get to that transformation zone which is hiding up there in the inner surface. So I must just do it anyway. So and as Jenny said, if, if you are I think in those patients, if you are concerned that you're not going to get high enough, then you should actually do a cold much problem. But obviously, logistically, that's really yeah. tricky. So the other alternative, as Joseph described, is then to take a second scoop. Yeah. Um, of the, the top back. Of the, you know, a second scoop with a smaller loop of the endoservice. Um, and Lisa? Those electrodes with the wire that comes mm -hmm. out like a little sail. Yeah. Could you use that for a case like this? Could you actually have a small mm -hmm. part yeah. on the outer that you want to get? Yeah. Is there a reason you don't do it? Is there a reason why we... It's so funny, those yeah, yeah. And then we, why they cut the apples? We, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't... We can buy them. For those specific patients. You can obviously now in this place, but you can actually get them. Yeah. We can buy some of them. Just on a... <coughs> um, on a post legs um, histology report, it is important to look at your own data. We don't do it, unfortunately, anymore. We used to sit with our own LEDs um, procedures and go through the histology. Um, it's important for you to go through your own results and see if you actually get those lesions. And if you have a high-grade lesion on cytology and you find nothing on histology, then you must go back to the pathologist and say, I mean, where is, what is happening here? You either didn't do a proper um, sample or a lens that's deep enough, or <clears throat> maybe the cytology was overcalled. Um, but it's important to not sort of ignore your histology and get it and compare it to what you've done and see in the um, And we don't do that often enough anymore. To add on to that, I thank you to the registrars who are faithful corposity clinic who, who checks the results. So um, unfortunately, I remember when I was a registrar of Prof. Well, it's not, yeah, he was a young consultant. Yeah, we had to, uh, we, we sat down, I think, once a week and together went through the results. Um, so, so it's important to, to check the results. Uh, so thanks for you who, who does that, uh, who do that. Um, and don't just read the bottom line, read the report, because sometimes um, there are, 
there are things that the pathologists write in the report that you will miss if you just read CRM3 or whatever. Uh, so read the report, and if there are discrepancies, uh, don't just say, oh, okay, so what? Uh, those we want to actually, uh, the last year or so, we've actually referred very few colposcopy cases to the pathology meeting. Uh, remember we had a regular meeting on a Monday with a pathologist where we want to review some of these cases where they, they would have been in this case. Yeah. Uh, lastly, uh, two things. Uh, I want to congratulate the registrars for being here in big numbers this afternoon. Uh, really, I think you can give yourself